A welcome to the congregation to our evening worship service. As we gather together, it is for the explicit purpose of bringing a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving uh, to the one true God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it is not only our responsibility to worship, but it is also a holy privilege afforded to us by God's providence and His grace that we have the opportunity to draw this day to a conclusion, gathered together to worship our Lord. Our call to worship tonight is taken from Psalm 9, the first two verses, where the psalmist says, I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of all your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. And let's seek to do just that this evening, beginning our service with a word of prayer. Lord God Almighty, uh, we also desire to imitate the psalmist of old and to praise you with the wholeness of our heart. We are those who are also glad and who rejoice in you and who desire to tell of all of your marvelous works, your marvelous works as they evidence themselves in the beautiful realm of creation that testifies of your greatness but especially your marvelous works which you have accomplished through your Son, Jesus Christ, uh, both in his steps of humiliation and also in his steps of exaltation, even as he now sits on the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. We pray, Lord, that for his sake you would bless us tonight, that we would be able to sing praises to your name, that we might present unto you through Jesus Christ and his finished work, an evening sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. We ask this for his name. Amen. We'll begin our service then with song from selection 159 of the Trinity Psalter hymnal. If Abel will stand as we sing all five stanzas of selection 159.
As we begin our worship service tonight, we do so once again acknowledging that our help is in the name of the Lord who has made the heaven and the earth, and he greets us with these words. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ through the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We then take the opportunity once again as a congregation to express our faith. In doing so, we not only express what we call our subject of faith, the fact that we do have a trust and a confidence within our souls that is worked by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, but we also summarize the object of faith, that is, what it is that we believe in based upon the self-revelation of our God in His Word. Uh, We profess our faith joining with the church throughout the ages, using the words of the Apostles' Creed, saying together in one voice, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, uh, we call upon your name in prayer as we go through the various elements of this evening's worship service, and we begin our prayer by acknowledging your greatness, your power, your majesty, and how these things are unchangeable in you. Everything around us changes. Uh, We see the seasons change. Uh, We have sung about change, how there is also decay in all that we see in this realm of creation. We see change and even a measure of decay even within the mirror as we contemplate our own reflection. All of these things remind us of the passing of time and all that goes along with that, and yet you are the same. And you have always been the same, and you always will be the same. And that is part of the bedrock of our confidence as we live in the midst of changing times and even as we experience change within our persons. You are also unchanging in your will for our lives, and from the very beginning of human history, you have desired that your people would corporately, publicly gather themselves together to worship you, and we acknowledge you are worthy of our worship. And so tonight we continue this ancient custom that is not just an ancient custom, but that is also a principal command that we would gather ourselves to enter into your presence in a unique way. And with the profession of our mouths and with the songs of our hearts and also with the listening and the attentiveness of our ears that we would acknowledge that you are God, that we would worship you in spirit and truth. And as we worship you, Father, we ask that we might receive a blessing, a blessing of the increase of our faith, a faith that looks to Jesus Christ and Him alone, a faith that is an understanding faith, a faith that understands the person of Jesus Christ and also His work. And so as we turn tonight to consider the death of Jesus Christ and His burial and His descent into hell, uh, Lord, we 
confess that here we come to the very center of the gospel. And so we ask for clarity in speaking and also for understanding and listening. And not only may this be an intellectual exercise, but may it be a, a profound spiritual exercise as we contemplate these deep, mysterious truths which even angels themselves desire to peer into, the salvation of your people. Father, we ask for your providence to continue to watch over us as we begin a new week in this day and as we look forward to the days uh, that will follow as we go about our various activities. We pray for traveling mercies. Uh, we know that there are a number of families that are in other localities today and as they perhaps visit family or as they uh, visit other places, Lord, watch over them. But also as we go through the routine activities of our uh, work week on the job sites and in the factories and in the office. Uh, Lord, watch over us. Protect us also in the fields. We thank you for the abundant harvest that uh, we would suppose is nearing completion, but as uh, work continues in the fields, we ask for safety for those who spend these hours. Uh, we pray not only for physical protection, we also pray for spiritual protection for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we know that the church is not perfect, and there have sadly been uh, times in which individuals have, have fallen into grievous sin. There have also been times in which the church has been plagued with schism and disunity, and all of this uh, brings many to mock and to ridicule uh, the church and the Christ of the church. And so we pray that you would sanctify us as those who profess your name and that our lives might adorn our profession, that our godliness might give evidence to the fact that we indeed are those who believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. So, give us a certain carefulness as we go about our lives. Protect us from temptation. Uh, we ask that you would remember those who are physically ill, that you would give them healing, uh, those that perhaps struggle with illnesses or weaknesses of uh, the mind or uh, of the the psyche. There are so many mysteries, especially in this area, but we pray, Father, that your people might experience uh, an abundance of life, and that for those who are weak and discomforted, that they might have the strength that they stand in need of, and that they might also have a hope for the days that lie ahead. We ask for your blessing upon the advancement, not only the maintenance of the church, but also the advancement. We, we pray that your church would grow. Uh, we pray that individuals would be added to your church. Uh, we're thankful for those who are expecting little ones. We pray that their formation may continue well. We also pray, Lord, that individuals who, as of now, are outside of the covenant community might, might come to conversion, uh, that there might be uh, more uh, adult baptisms witnessed within the church, that individuals might, might come and uh, their mature years as well, who perhaps are strangers to the gospel, that they, might, that they may hear the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that uh, they might also repent and believe and be added unto the number of the church. And so we pray for the laborers who labor in your kingdom. Uh, we think tonight especially of Reverend Eric Pennings and his work with Miami International Theological Seminary. We ask that you would sustain him in his work along with his colleague, Jose Ramirez, uh, we have been informed that Jose has experienced uh, a medical condition and is in need of recuperation, so we pray that you would bless him, that he might regain strength, and that he might once again uh, pick up his labors. We're thankful for the recent 164 graduates in 11 countries. It reminds us that your church is a universal church, and we pray for each one of these graduates in the, the areas in which they minister. Uh, we think especially of students and graduates now who study and who labor in the midst of extreme political and social unrest, would you protect them and grant them success in their labors? Uh, and it reminds us, Father, of how grateful we are for our context of, of peace and of the ability, the opportunity to, without any hindrance, call upon your name to worship you uh, corporately and publicly, and we pray that those freedoms might be preserved for us and for our children. And, and so we also pray for the upcoming election within our land. And again, our prayer is that for the sake of the righteous, that you would remember our land and that you would 
not give us over to our cells, but that you would appoint individuals who would seek to rule according to the design of the government, especially for the restraining and the punishing of the expressions of evil, and also for the protecting and the rewarding of those who do well. And, and by doing so, may in that way the civil magistrate uh, also not be a hindrance to the gospel ministry, uh, but actually serve to further the gospel ministry by permitting uh, and even hastening on the work of the church. We pray for our own community. Uh, we thank you for the measure of peace and safety that we have. Uh, we ask that these things would continue to be maintained, and so we pray for uh, law officials as well as first responders and various relief organizations within our community. Uh, we pray, Father, for the works of uh, mercy uh, in the, the hospitals and doctor's offices and so many other areas. Uh, Father, remember us for, for good, we pray. As we turn our attention now to Your Word, we pray that You would continually give us as a congregation uh, a a trust and a reliance in the authority of the Word of God, and may we always have spiritual eyes to see the main presentation of the Word, that of the Lord Jesus Christ. So may He be lifted high once again tonight, we pray for His name's sake. Amen. We'll then turn our attention to a song of preparation chosen from selection 278 of our Trinity Psalter hymnal. If able, we'll stand as we sing all the stanzas of 278.
Tonight in your Bibles, we would turn your attention to the Gospel according to John and to the 10th chapter from which we'll be reading verses 11 through 18. After the reading of the inspired Word of God, we'll also be reading from our Heidelberg Catechisms, Lord's Day 16. Lord's Day 16 is found in the Forms and Prayers book on page 217. Uh, John 10 verse 11 is found in the Pew Bible on page 1,235. Our catechism, as it seeks to instruct us in the basic fundamental elements of the Christian faith, is making its way through the Apostles' Creed. And of course, the Apostles' Creed, as many of our boys and girls and young people uh, reviewed this past week and also reviewed a bit this morning in catechism and Sunday school class, the Apostles' Creed is separated or divided into three sections, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This is because that is how God has revealed Himself in His Word. At this point in the Heidelberg Catechism, we're dealing with God the Son. Recently, we've had the opportunity to look at His name, His title, uh, also His identity as the only begotten Son of the Father. We come now to His work, to His work of redemption, or the work in which He accomplished salvation. And of course, that work is one, but theologians reflect upon the revelation of Scripture, and they make distinctions between what we call the states, or the steps of humiliation, and then the states, or the steps of exaltation. Uh, And generally speaking, there are five states, or steps of humiliation. The incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ, which we considered a number of weeks ago. Then the uh, sufferings of Jesus Christ, which we looked at last week. Uh, And then there are three more steps of humiliation, uh, that of the death of Jesus Christ, the burial of Jesus Christ, and then a summary statement, his descent into hell. And Lord's Day 16 covers those three steps. So Lord's Day 16 is a rather packed Lord's Day. Uh, We don't intend to exhaustively go through all of the details of those three steps Uh, of humiliation, Uh, but that's a bit of an overview uh, for where we are. And in connection uh, to these steps of humiliation, uh, the sufferings, the death, the burial, and the descent into hell, we chose to read from John 10, beginning at verse 11 through verse 18. Uh, There Jesus says as follows, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Thus far for now our reading from Scripture, we then... Look at Lord's Day 16 that has a number of questions, the first being question 40, why did Christ have to suffer death? And the answer, because God's justice and truth require it, nothing else could pay for our sins except the death of the Son of God. Question 41 asks, why was He buried? And the answer, His burial testifies that He really died. Question 42 asks, since Christ has died for us, why do we still have to die? And the answer, our death is not a payment for our sins, but only a dying to sins and an entering into eternal life. Question 43 asks, what further benefit do we receive from Christ's sacrifice and death on the cross? And the answer, by his power, our old man is crucified, put to death, and buried with him, so that the evil desires of the flesh may no longer rule us, but that instead we may offer ourselves as a sacrifice of thanksgiving to him. And then turning the page, question 44 asks, why does the creed add he descended into hell? And the answer, to assure me during attacks of deepest dread and temptation 
that Christ my Lord, by suffering unspeakable anguish, pain, and terror of soul on the cross, but also earlier, has delivered me from hellish anguish and torment. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, at times when life circumstances call us to stand next to the deathbed of a loved one, or perhaps the grave of a loved one, or perhaps when we reflect upon the passing on of a loved one, a question can linger within our mind, the question of why. Why did he have to die? Why did she have to die? Why did my spouse have to die? Uh, Why did my grandfather or my grandmother have to die? And perhaps as difficult as those questions are, maybe even a more painful question is, uh, why did this person have to die from our perspective prematurely, too early, too young? And, and, and why, did, why did they have to suffer on their deathbed? I want to be aware of the significance of that question, and later I want to address a few words to that question. But that question, why did he have to die, is even amplified more when it is asked in reference to the only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ. Hopefully we understand something in light of last week and in light of our education in the Christian faith. Hopefully we understand something of why he had to suffer. He suffered a substitutionary, atoning sacrifice. But, but why all the way to death? Why all the way to death? Well, we want to try to answer this question in line of our theme, which is Christian faith in the death of the Son. Noticing, first of all, the need for the death of the Son, and then secondly, the details of the death of the Son, and then thirdly, the benefits from the death of of the Son. So Christian faith in the death of the Son, the need, the details, and the benefits from the death of the Son. In an attempt to answer the question in reference to Jesus Christ, why why did he have to die? We first of all need to deal somewhat with the nature of death itself. What is death? Now, we have to acknowledge from the outset that this is not the most popular topic for us to talk about, especially when we find ourselves in the midst of life. And in our culture, very few people want to give any real dedicated consideration to the topic of death. Although it's interesting, is it not, that at this time of year, all of a sudden our culture becomes fixated upon death, but in a most unhelpful way. We speak here of uh, the Halloween season and its celebration uh, of the demonic and of the grotesque and of its attempt to make light the somber reality of death. But outside of perhaps a few days in the fall, most people, when they find themselves in the midst of life, and especially when they are young, they don't really give a whole lot of consideration to what exactly it is to die, nor why exactly it is that people die. And yet that's most ironic when you step back and think about it because unless, of course, our Lord visibly, triumphantly, in an open display of glory, physically returns prior, it's ironic that few consider death when death is inevitable. Death is inevitable. Hebrews 9, verse 27 and 28 sets forth this truth. It is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. It is appointed unto men to die once. Now, I'm not the most tech-savvy individual, but I try to keep up with the advancements of technology. I try to use uh, my calendar on my phone, and I'll, I'll put different events in there, different activities in there. Uh, But you know, there is the opportunity to edit. And so maybe we make an appointment, maybe we we schedule a meeting, but then we come back and we say, oh, that doesn't work out for me, or it got changed. And so we, we, we click the edit button and we change the date, we change the time. Maybe we even delete the event. 
but it is appointed unto man once to die, and there is no editing of that date. There is no opportunity to go in to the eternal decree of God and find the date of our physical death and say, I want to delete that. It is appointed unto man once to die. After this, the judgment. The text, of course, continues, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Because death can be distinguished into three different aspects. Of course, they're all connected, but when we speak about death, uh, there is what you might call spiritual death, and there is physical death, and there is eternal death. Uh, and working descriptions of those might be along these lines. Uh, spiritual death is the, uh, the lack of fellowship the lack of fellowship with God, the lack of harmony with God, and the spiritual bondage uh, that is the resulting factor. And, and this Adam and Eve, uh, the moment that they rebelled, the moment that they violated the covenant of works, you will remember that God specifically said, and God's word is true, God said, the day you eat, dying you will die. And sometimes when we're young, we might think, well, well Adam didn't didn't fall over right away physically dead, and, and Eve didn't fall over right away physically dead, so did they really die? And the answer is yes, in the sense that the process of death began, especially in the spiritual sense, because you remember that that very moment the eyes of Adam and Eve were opened, and they recognized a sense of guilt and a sense of shame. And so they were no longer walking in fellowship with God when God came to fellowship and commune with them in the cool of the day. Instead of enjoying that opportunity, Adam and Eve fled, and they hid themselves. Now, thanks be to God's grace, God called out and made a covenant promise that was centered upon the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. But what they experienced there was that spiritual death that then was transferred to all of the descendants of Adam's race. And so, of course, Ephesians 2 most notably says, and you who were dead in sins and in trespasses. Now, thankfully, it also goes on and says he made a lie, but that's our condition by nature, spiritual death, dead in sins and in trespasses. But then, of course, there's also the aspect of physical death, and this is the separation of body and soul. Human nature is made up of two elements, if you were, but these two elements were originally designed to be a unity. Uh, and yet, when physical death takes its ultimate toll, there is the dividing of that which was designed to be united, that of body and soul. And so the body, of course, upon physical death, returns to the ground from which it came, from dust you came, from dust you shall return. And the soul, we know this by the testimony of Scripture, the soul, that immaterial, spiritual element of our person, returns back uh, into the immediate presence of God. And then there's the third aspect of, of death, that is eternal death. Eternal death is that final, complete alienation that the unbeliever experiences of an absolute absence of any favorable relationship with God. And so there is spiritual death, there is physical death, and there is eternal death. And it could all be summarized up as that death is to be forsaken, forsaken by God. So why did Jesus Christ have to die? Because of sin. And because sin confronts itself against the justice of God. You see, God spoke, the day you eat, you shall surely die, not just in an arbitrary manner, but God's truth in His words is an expression of His nature, of His justice. And here again, we make distinctions. We make the distinction between God's rhetorical justice, where He, because He's God, has the right and align with His nature to determine that which is good and that which is evil. We don't have that right. We cannot, although individuals, sadly, in our society may arrogantly pretend that they can declare that which is right and wrong, but ultimately that all belongs to God. 
And God in His rectorial justice by virtue of His nature says this is, this is good, this is evil. And then alongside His rectorial justice, there is also His retributive justice that if you violate His command, if you don't do that which is good, you incur a penalty because He's a just judge. And He's very clear for one example, which many of us perhaps have memorized, Romans 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. Because of God's justice, because of His holy nature expressed in His truth, the wages of sin is death. And so if Christ comes to pay the wages of sin on behalf of those who have sinned, then he must pay the ultimate price of death. So why did Jesus Christ have to die? You might boil it down to this, to satisfy the truth of God's holy righteousness on behalf of sinners. Well, what then of our second point, the details of the death of the Son? And we're not going to go into what you might say, the gory details, the horrific description of the brutal crucifixion manner. What I have in mind here is just simply to identify the fact that the death of the Son, and we refer here to His physical death, but also eventually to His eternal death, that it was an historical event. And I want to address the young people in attendance. Because there have always been, but in your day, there continue to be individuals within the churches, within Christian institutions, who are often very applauded, put it that way, very popular, but in subtle, but also non so subtle ways, they they repackaged the Christian faith. And one of what the things that liberalism does is it begins to, to tweak the historicity or the historical reality of these events of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible is very plain, though. Jesus Christ died. There was an actual day in which an actual event took place. And in that actual event, Jesus Christ, as He suffered the wrath of God being poured out upon Him, as He stood in the place of His people, there was an actual moment in which His human nature, body and soul, were separated. This is what he, he says in essence in our text, which we read. He says, for example, in verse 18, verse 17 rather, Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. So he willingly, he freely, he voluntarily lays down his life in the sense that his human nature is divided. And, and so, of course, we, we read the historical narratives as they are accurately recorded in the accounts of the Gospels, and young people don't ever doubt the Word of God. If you have questions, that's fine. Ask those questions. Seek answers to those questions, but always seek those answers from what God has revealed in His Word, because His Word is truth. And the Bible reveals that when Jesus Christ died, His body was laid into a tomb or into a grave. And His soul, we know, because He says to the repentant thief, today you will be in paradise. Then He says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, which is basically a synonymous term for soul. So we see there the division of those two elements. So we see that He actually underwent a very real physical death, his human nature, body and soul, were divided. 
as he experienced the wages of sin. Not only is his death a historical event, also his burial. And I remember when I was a young boy, sometimes I thought, okay, if Jesus had to die on the cross, and maybe these are just the ponderings of of my childhood, but I thought to myself, you know, why couldn't he die just for, just for a moment? Just for a second. And, and then come right back to life on that same Friday and, and proclaim triumphantly from the cross, you guys thought you had me. Why did his body have to be taken off of that cross and, and laid in a tomb? Now, our catechism is right, and it gets to part of the answer when it says to, to prove that he really died. Because here again, false teachers uh, in their ignorance sometimes have said, well, he didn't really die. So there's, there's always been this teaching known as the swoon theory that says, well, Jesus just, just passed out on the cross because of the, the pressure of everything he had suffered. But then when he was laid in the tomb and when the cool night hours came, you know, then, then he revived, and all of this is just complete foolishness. Jesus Christ really died, and he was laid into the tomb, and yes, his lying in the tomb proves that he really died, but there's more, because what does the tomb signify? What does the grave signify? Apart from the work of Christ, the grave signifies uh, the curse of, of God's justice upon the sin of human race. So the the curse initially in its original context is you eat of the forbidden fruit, you die, and you return to the dust from which you came. And what does Jesus Christ do in his burial but his body goes into that power of the grave? But here's the remarkable thing. The power of the grave is powerless. Because without being too graphic, we know what happens to a human body after death when it is laid into a grave. We we know the, the decomposition that begins to take place as you can even see the reality of it returning to dust. But none of that happens to the body of the Lord Jesus Christ because He has already conquered death. And so He enters into the grave to defeat and to make an open show of defeat of the power of the grave. So He then, and we'll get to this in future weeks, Lord willing, He not only enters into the grave, but He exits the grave. And He does this in large part not only to make a visible display that He has conquered the grave, but so that we as Christians, when we anticipate the time when our bodies will enter into the grave, we can look to that occasion without fear. We can say, in essence, I have no fear of my own grave because my Savior has already been there and it could not hold him. He went into the grave, and he came out of the grave. And I know that by union with him through saving faith, yes, most likely, again, unless the Lord returns first, and we long for that day and we pray for that day, but if he does not return before I die, I know that my body will be buried. And passing, not cremated, uh, unless there is some worldwide outbreak of some type of bubonic type plague, Christian burial is an act of honoring the body for which Christ died. Christ died for our soul, but also our body. And the clear universal testimony throughout Scripture is that Christians are buried in an act of faith. Buried in an act of faith, anticipating and looking forward to the resurrection. Because Christ came victoriously out of the grave, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that my very same body, with changes, yes, a glorified body, will come forth out of that grave. There are 12 articles of our Christian faith. 
congregation, there are many, many, many things that I do not know. But there are 12 things that I and you, we know beyond any shadow of a doubt based upon the testimony of the Word of God. And one of those 12 is the resurrection of the dead. This I know, that my body will not lie forgotten in the grave. And how do I know that? Because of the testimony of Holy Scripture and because Jesus Christ went into the grave, but he also came out of the grave. And so I would encourage us in an exercise of faith, any time we have a committal service, a graveside service, for a Christian who dies in the faith, as you stand around that grave, think, my elder brother, my Savior, my mediator, my Redeemer, my Lord, has already gone into the grave, and it could not hold him. In the burial of my grandfather, we actually had the opportunity not only to go to the graveside, but to watch as the casket was lowered down into the grave. And I thought to myself, the day is going to come when that body is not going to go down. That body is going to come up. Now, was there still sorrow? Absolutely. Were there questions? Absolutely. But there was sorrow and there were questions that were seasoned with faith based upon the burial of Jesus Christ. Not only do we believe in the historicity of the death of the Son and the burial of the Son, but also His descent into hell. And and there is a question about this article. What exactly was its original significance? We could talk about that later, and there's excellent resources written about it. But the best interpretation of this article is the one that was given by John Calvin that this article is in some way a a summary article. It's not as if Jesus, after he died, went in some way to the actual locality of the damned, but rather it's a reflective article saying that in all of the experiences of Gethsemane, of Golgotha, of those hours of darkness, The Son of God suffered the agony of hell. He took the full cup of God's wrath. Think of it this way. God could not have added any more wrath to that which the Son endured. And because of His divine nature upholding His human nature, Jesus Christ suffered the infinite wrath of God in a finite space of time. And when we we reference this article of faith, I believe that Jesus Christ descended into hell, faced the fullness of divine wrath, and satisfied the fullness of divine wrath. That gives real pastoral comfort. Now notice what question 44 asks. Why does the creed add he descended into hell? Notice the answer. And here, I really believe that our authors of the catechism are reflecting the pastoral note of the Scriptures, and especially of Jesus Christ himself, because Jesus Christ, especially as he was moving up to his death, he spent much time with his disciples instructing them comforting them. And that's exactly why he says to them, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life. Jesus is saying, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, He understood the ignorance of the disciples. He understood the weakness of the disciples. 
and he condescended down to their ignorance and to their weakness. He doesn't compliment their ignorance and their weakness, but he condescends down and he seeks to speak words of comfort and words of assurance. And I really believe that our authors are, are reflecting on this. And notice how they begin their answer to question 44. Why does the creed add he descended to hell? It doesn't get like overly scholastic. It doesn't get overly intellectual. It gets very pastoral. To assure me. To assure me. To remind me of these truths. Uh, to, to build up my confidence in these truths. To give me comfort in these truths. Remember, that's the, the overall theme of the catechism. Comfort in life and comfort in death. To assure me. But notice when, when it assures me. To assure me during attacks of deepest dread. Do you ever have those attacks? Do you ever have attacks of deep dread? Of spiritual dread? The authors of our catechism, by beginning their answer this way, show a pastoral sensitivity that there are times in which true Christians exercising true faith, nevertheless have attacks of deepest dread and temptation. Perhaps it is seasons in life, near the end of one's life, as Satan goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour as he wages a final assault upon the spirit of the Christian. Perhaps it is after a person falls into sin and Satan loves to come and accuse. Perhaps it is when an individual is struggling with the limitations that come with poor health physically or mentally or the combination between the two. Perhaps it is when various circumstances in life seem to take their toll upon a person's vibrancy of faith. What is a person to do? What is a Christian to do during these times of attacks of deepest dread and temptation? In part, they are to remind themselves, I believe Jesus Christ descended into hell. That he and he alone experienced the fullness of divine wrath so that Everyone who places their trust, their faith in Him will never experience the anguish of hell. Anguish, perhaps of soul, but not anguish of hell. As a Christian, I, you, we can never and will never have to experience divine wrath, perhaps paternal displeasure, perhaps our Father's corrective hand, and sometimes in unpleasant ways, but the intention behind those divine corrections is always a favorable intention. Our, our Father desires the best for us when He corrects us. The Christian will never, can never, experience the anguish of hell because Christ has. And he has experienced the fullness of that. And this segues into the benefits from the death of the Son. And the benefits could be summarized as basically twofold, although they could be fleshed out in a number of different ways and manners. But in our third point, the benefits from the death of the Son it include, first of all, the deliverance from the threat of punishment. If you wanted a theological term, you could say the, the benefit, first of all, is that of justification. The wages of sin have been paid. The guilt has been dealt with definitively at the cross. So often, and I know I've quoted this verse a number of times, but you can think of 
Romans 8, verse 1, there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You can think of Romans 5, verse 1, therefore having peace with God. This is the confidence that we have because of the death, the burial, and the descent into hell of Jesus Christ. But I want to make a point of application that this confidence is a sure confidence, but only for those who belong to Jesus Christ. The gospel is not universalistic in the sense that every single individual person is free from the wrath of God. Only but all, only but all of those who believe, who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Romans 5 verse 1, you remember, says, therefore, having been justified by faith. By faith in Jesus Christ. By faith in in the sufferings of Jesus Christ, by faith in the death of Jesus Christ, by faith in the burial of Jesus Christ, by faith in the descent of Jesus Christ into hell. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. So there is this wonderful, soul-comforting, soul-invigorating truth of justification. And, and, I, and I hope I hope that we as a congregation understand and appreciate the truth of justification by faith alone. Of being legally declared to be in full conformity to the law so that, imagine this, so that God looks upon me as if I had never sinned. And you might say there's, there's more. As wonderful as that first aspect is, based upon the imputation of, of Christ's passive obedience, God looks on me as if I had never sinned. There is more. And as if I had kept all of the commandments perfectly. That's how judicially God looks upon the person who has faith in Jesus Christ. And not only justification, there is also sanctification. And, and this, of course, is fleshed out in, in much greater detail in the third section of the catechism that deals with the manner in which we are to show forth thankfulness or gratitude uh, for the deliverance that God has accomplished. Uh, but just know that by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, especially uh, that of His resurrection, there is a new, not only state, but also condition given to the people of God. We think here of Romans 6 verse 11, likewise you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We, we talk about definitive sanctification, that the, the power of sin, the bondage of sin, that, 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 that death grip of sin has been broken through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to borrow a quote from Zacharias Ursinus, the primary author of the Catechism, and he, he speaks this way, the person who boasts of having applied to himself by faith the death of Christ, and yet has no desire to live a holy and godly life, that he may so honor the Savior, that person lies. The person who walks around saying, sure, I believe. I, I, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in his death. But has no real desire to live a, a holy life and a, and a godly life. By that very fact reveals that the profession is an empty profession. Because while we must always distinguish between justification which affects our state, and sanctification, 
which affects our condition. We must always distinguish those two. But we can never divorce them because they are the dual benefits which come to the person who is united to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a package deal. You have one, you have the other. If you're justified, you're also sanctified. If your sins have been paid for, you are also set free from the bondage of sin. Now, we're not implying perfectionism in this life. We struggle against sin up until our death. And our physical death is not the expression of God's wrath. It's not the expression of God's displeasure. Always remember what the psalmist said in Psalm 116, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And this is why at times mature people of God as they age, there's a a notable transition in their desire. There's always a desire to live, and this is especially strong in those who are young. But at times when saints age, gradually their desire becomes that of Paul, to depart, to be done definitively with temptation, to be done definitively with sin and to enter into the fullness of that eternal rest that awaits all who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And a closing word of application to anyone who may have that desire, that's a legitimate desire, but God is sovereign in his timing. And until the day appointed unto us to die, Let us live for the glory of God, especially in reflecting upon the death, the burial, and the descent into hell of our precious Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we do glorify you for the work which you have accomplished uh, through your Son, applied to our hearts by the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, We have attempted to cover much ground concerning the death and the burial and the ascent into hell. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would bless these words unto our hearts. We think especially perhaps of individuals who might be in the midst of deep spiritual dread or, or temptation. May they find hope and comfort knowing that Jesus Christ has suffered the unspeakable anguish, pain, and terror of soul in our place. Uh, Father, we ask for a strong and a vibrant faith for those that are young as well as those who are old, a faith that glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. We'll then turn to our song of dedication that's taken tonight from selection 452. We'll stand as we sing the four stanzas of 452. Afterwards, you may be seated again.
Then as a congregation, we'll present our evening tithes and offerings, which the deacons will be receiving for Pathways of Pella. After that collection is taken up, we'll stand as we sing our doxology from Selection 568. And now, people of God, receive the blessing of your Lord and go together in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.